point, Vijay. And um, again, I'd like to just come back to the city question a little bit. Richard, Sundar, you guys have some things on the whole franchise model. Singapore is based itself on the event model. So would you like to share some insights on that? Uh, to me, uh, sport is, is about appointment is about appointment for either a destination and therefore the people in that, in that uh, city or the country. Different sport operate very differently. You take the Olympics or the FIFA model where the city gets energized over a period of six to eight years where they know they're trying to build infrastructure. But each city needs to be conscious whether that investment becomes white elephant at the end of the event. At the end of eight years when the, when the show is done, what happens to those facilities? Are they going to be continually used or is it money down the drain? You made the money over the eight years building it and that's about it. Or the other model which is a calendarized model, take the Wimbledon for example or take uh, English Premier League or the IPL or any of the other sport where you know as fans there is a culture of sports in the city because that time of the year this is the show that's going to happen every year. So there's a fair bit of presence and interest that continues and therefore the ecosystem survives for that period of time. If you're lucky as, as the Americans are, you have for eight months of, you know, American sport that happens, played amongst themselves called the World Series. But the fact is you, you have the opportunity to build any model. But to give it that Philip, you may require a couple of sporting events to happen in India. India's, India's cricket growth happened on the back of 1987 World Cup that we hosted. The infrastructure came up, people started to flock to the cities, wanted to watch many other countries. That was a turning point on the back of a 83 win. That set the foundation so strong for people to look forward to the sport, take up the sport, play the sport, watch the sport. So you could follow any of these models as long as we are clear there is a purpose of hosting an event and therefore building infrastructure for people to come and participate. So either of it works. And, and Singapore is trying to do both the calendarization and the destination city for a lot of sport now. That's what... I, I think we're looking at it across um, all areas. And when I, I think about it, what really drives us is when you think of global cities, when you think of a New York and when you think of a London, immediately, you know, you have finance, you have commerce, you have arts, you have education, you have healthcare, and you have sport. Um, so when you mm -hmm. think of a global city, you really can't be a global city unless you have a vibrant sport culture. And I think when we look at the composition of residents in Singapore, they come here for business, they come here for work, they come here for healthcare, they come here to get educated. And if you don't have the sport, something is lacking. So we're now augmenting the calendar with the likes of Formula One, with the likes of tennis, with the likes of rugby. And hopefully soon, I've seen some of the questions come up, uh, yep. hopefully with the likes of IPL cricket so one day. Are we going to see an IPL game here at the sports club? Sundar, are you bringing the team for free? I mean, we don't have money. Sorry. <laughs> Every five years, India goes through elections. 2009, we went to South Africa. 2014, we went to the UAE. May not be IPL matches in 2019, but hopefully IPL team matches or IPL team so we're going to see, matches here. Yeah. We just want a commitment from you. When are we going to see Chennai Super Kings versus Mumbai Indians in the sports up from the two of you? We just want the commitment. We don't want to question all that. We just want the commitment. Make it happen. My counter is open. <laughs> the stadium is built. <laughs> uh, but. But, but, but I think, the sponsor, uh, the sponsor is here, and I'll I, do. I the, knew you'd come here, you and I'll do the, and yeah, I'll yeah, do the yeah, selections. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, it's done, guys. They're coming. <laughs> uh, but I think there are a few interesting questions uh, out here, and I'm going to keep this rapid fire and ask for very short one-word, two-word answers. Vijay, will Roger win one final Grand Slam as the last hurrah? Yes. <laughs> yes, he will. Sundar, to what extent do you think the IPL is responsible for the decline in the performance of the Indian team at the test level? Give me a percentage. Zero. <laughs> How many of you out there think 100? <laughs> uh, are we going to look forward, again, it's, it's also related to another sporting event in Singapore. Are we going to look forward to Singapore Open soon? Tennis, I guess, is the, you're doing the WTA, but do we expect to see top uh, male tennis stars coming? For sure, we hope so. Okay, a lot of the questions I'm going to naturally go to Vijay and I'm just going to quickly run through them. Uh, Ili Nasta said, John McEnroe, two of the most talented players you've ever seen. I don't know how you can give me a one-word rapid-fire answer to this, but why do you say that? 
Eli Nastase. I've heard you say that Eli Nastase and John McEnroe are the two most talented players you've ever seen. Yes, I think they were both absolute geniuses, no question about it. And I was saying earlier to a uh, group that uh, there's a big difference between a genius and a champion. A, a, a champion has worked himself to be in a situation where he knows exactly what he's doing and when to do it and how to feel in a situation where there's 30, 40, or 3, 4, or 4, 5. A genius doesn't know, he just plays with intuition. And as long, if he doesn't know about it, there's no way the opponent is going to find out. Uh, and I always say when Nastasia and McEnroe have been pushed into a corner to play a stroke, and there are three options for the stroke that can possibly be delivered, McEnroe and Nastasia had options four and five that they themselves didn't know, and that's why they were so great. Speciality coaches, in, and I guess this is, hap <laughs> this is happening in every sport. I mean, it's happening in cricket, it's happening in track and field, in tennis. Uh, are they good for the game or are they bad for the game? You know, people who are physical coach, mind coach, serve coach, volley coach, etc. Are they good for the game or they? <laughs> I, mean, I don't know how they can all work together, but <laughs> the person that you really need in your corner when you're playing a tight match is a priest. <laughs> <laughs> so, I am, I am going to ask at this moment Vijay to share a story. I mean, I was at a Don Bosco alumni event. We went to the same school. Um, and he was at that event about uh, four weeks ago, Vijay, and uh, he shared the story about what happens when you're in a tight corner in a match that he was playing with John McEnroe. It's also a pitch for Don Bosco, but it's very relevant in alumni things. So you've got to tell that story because it's a story that needs to be shared. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I was playing this event in the Canadian Open in Toronto many, many years ago, and uh, I was having a real problem with McEnroe. He was my toughest competitor. I found it hard to play him. My game sort of matched the way he played, and however well I played, he always seemed to play better. And I had very good success against Connors and Borg, and I, and I didn't quite have the same su success against McEnroe. And I was playing him in, in the Canadian Open one year in Toronto, and the, st the stands were very large and were completely full, and I was, I'd won the first set, I lost the second, the match was getting away from me. Another exciting that was really happening in the third set, but he got into a lead, in a position of a lead, and everybody was hating him, and, and which was quite common. And, and I, there was nothing that was going to turn me around at that stage. He was very firmly in the driver's seat. And then as he was about to serve at one point, I think it was 4-1 or something, 30-15, uh, and uh, right from the top end of the stadium, I heard a scream from one of the uh, people up there, and, and he said, uh, come on, Vijay, do it for Don Bosco. As soon as McEnroe asked him to shut up, I knew I was in the driver's seat. You know? <laughs> and I ended up winning 7-5 in the third. So. Uh, Piyush, did you have a question? Piyush has a question and, uh, you know, I, I really wish we, and the hall's filled up, I really wish we could go on with this forever, but uh, almost all of them will be there somewhere in the break and, you know, have a few questions. But Piyush had one. Can you give the... Volume to Pierce's mic, please. Okay, sorry. I want to go where you sort of were going to, but weren't. The traditional narrative around sports is a good narrative. It's about family, it's about character, it's about building values, governments get involved, privilege, opportunity, etc. To me, what's striking is what Sam said. Sponsorship in the sport in Asia from minus 40% of Europe equals Europe today. And the IPL is a classic example of what money can do to a sport. The truth is sport today is entertainment. And it is a business. There was this question up there we didn't get aired saying maybe sport should say sport but not become a business. My question is this whole transformation of business to actually a sport to actually make it a business, to make it entertainment, to use it to drive Kabaddi leagues or IPLs. Isn't that a good thing? And shouldn't we do more of it rather than less of it? So, the narrative around goodness and family is good, but shouldn't we really think about it as a business, entertainment, and encourage that as the primary driver of the, of the, of the industry going forward? So, oh, I think absolutely. Sam has a great also uh, fact on that, but Vijay, please. Sorry, Suresh. But, but absolutely, please. No question about it. I think that's the greatest thing that IPL has done, is that people do believe, uh, as we said 35 years ago when we played the sport, and nobody, everyone said to you, what do you do for a living? I think the important thing is we've been able to create an environment where people starting to believe that it can be a profession, it can be a lifestyle, 
it can be something that you can excel in and make money from it and commercialize what you have. I mean, uh, in the days of Bjorn Borg, who was a unique, unique athlete, he had 32 contracts that had nothing to do with the game. It was not Reebok, Nike, and uh, any, of the, any of the sporting goods apparel uh, manufacturers, but it was something with towels and bathrobes and, uh, and, and aftershave lotion, which I would never touch, but in any event, uh, he, he had incredible amount of, of control over the marketing of a product. And I think to a great extent today, what IPL has taken off in the last 10 years is that everyone feels that they can actually get into cricket and make a life out of it, make a profession out of it. My point is that when someone has done that and has been left behind, let us not forget him. The few of us who have been fortunate enough to have done very well in a particular sport economically as opposed to just results wise, and I think where the risk factor is that we do not want to see him sort of die a slow death. And I think that's where the concern is. And, and I really, really hope that uh, the commercialization of sport makes society believe that a child can make it into a profession. And Sam, you have some great, uh, you know, we were talking about how much people are putting into sport and how the money is doing that, so. Yeah. It's a great comment because in Asia now, we are the number one socially digital connected region in the world. So there's more internet users anywhere in the world than in Asia, we're number one. Number two, we're now number one in e-commerce. So these two factors are becoming very, very important for sport. Uh, we were talking offline about the importance of e-commerce for the IPL. Uh, some great facts that I'll hand over to you about that and how many tickets are sold on, on, on an e-commerce basis. But it's a great question because sport builds ecosystems around it. It's just not that pitch and that stadium. There are many, many businesses that go around it. Um, and that $14 billion of sports sponsorship that's gone into Asia just doesn't go to that field. It goes to a many ecosystems around it. So you're seeing many industries being built in China, India, and in Singapore around the sporting industry, which is fantastic. Um, so it's a great question and, and something that corporations must be part of for society, but then also for business. Thank you very much. Uh, I really have to cut this short. I know we have a lot more questions, but you know, the perfect time to go is when people are asking for more, hmm. not when you outstay your welcome like do. So I think I'd like to thank my panel, and I'm going to do a very quick summary. I mean, I think it's fantastic because in some way when we put this together, what we are all hearing is all of you parents out there, let your kids follow their dreams. Singapore's building the, the ecosystem to help them do that. Sam's going to provide all the money. And you know, people like Sundar are, are creating these commercial models where actually, I, I think it goes back to the fact that you know, we are actually finally now seeing an area where sports can be as important as the formal education that most of us believed was important. Thank you very much to this great panel. Let, me, uh, sorry, let me just add one, one last point here, and that is that uh, when you do let your children play a sport, and when they do get good, and when they do get to represent you, and when they do get to represent your country, that moment is truly priceless. What you guys didn't hear is that Sundar and Richard are going to have a conversation about that IPL game just yes. outside. <laughs> if you could. If you could.